A really warm welcome to the Goldsmith Centre this evening. We're delighted to be welcoming you to this preview of Shine 2020. My name is Charlotte Jew and I'm the Public Programme Manager here at the Centre. And I'm joined this evening um, by my coll colleague, Isabel Kime, who I will ask to say hello. Hi there, and my name is Isabel Kime. I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager for the Goldsmith Centre. Welcome, everyone. So we are really pleased um, to have so many of you joining us this evening to celebrate um, the 2020 Shine cohort's work and all um, their efforts to present their new collections um, to us this evening. Um, the way this evening will run is that um, we will meet each of our fantastic 11 makers in turn. If you have any um, technical issues or if you have anything, um, any sort of dialogue that you would like to have with the other participants in tonight's event, then please do use the chat to say hello and, and share thoughts. But if you have a question for any of the makers who you're meeting this evening, we would ask that you pop that in the Q&A function. So you will find all of these functions at the bottom of your screen, you can click on them. And if you use the Q&A, we will hope to come to those questions towards the end of the event this evening and, um, and pose those to the makers. If we don't manage to get um, to all of those questions, we obviously will um, look to answer them either in person and um, by email or via social media. So yeah, do share your thoughts and, and questions with us this evening. Um, we can't see you because we've set this up as a webinar, so um, we won't be able to, we won't be able to hear you. Um, that those main communication methods I've mentioned are, are how we can interact. So without further ado, um, I would like to um, share with you a welcome from our director, Peter Taylor, who would love to have been saying it in person, but um, due to Wi-Fi issues, has kindly recorded um, a welcome for this evening. So Isabel is going to kindly share that with you now. Welcome everyone to Shine 2020, our digital showcase of, of talent, which this year we're taking online for the first time. I'm incredibly grateful to the whole team here at the Goldsmith Centre, the enormous amount of work that has gone into showcasing these talented 11 makers and bringing their work to you when we weren't actually able to show it physically here on site. The team have worked incredibly hard, as have the makers, to showcase their work to you this evening. And from my perspective, I'm very proud to see us operating in a new way that reflects a very challenging environment for both ourselves and the makers that we work with. Um, please support the makers this evening. You know, their work is on sale and we would be delighted if you were able to feed back to us on this event, and what, what we've got right, what we've got wrong. Uh, and, and generally, I just hope that you really enjoy yourself and all the hard work that has gone into this pays off and you get a great experience tonight. Thank you. So um, our first maker this evening, who we are delighted to welcome is Katie Watson. And um, before we speak to you, Katie, Isabel is going to share a film. I should say that part of the training that the makers have um, gone through this summer is um, in filmmaking. So they, what you're going to see tonight is the product um, of them filming themselves and um, sharing their inspirations behind their making practice. So Isabel, thank you for sharing Katie's film. I'm Katie Watson. I'm a jeweler and silversmith, mainly focusing on silversmithing and focusing on the technique of chasing and legacy. I mean, I guess from quite a young age, I've been quite creative. I first kind of started off painting. I like to be quite expressive in that. Yeah, I didn't really know much about jewellery and silversmithing, but when I was choosing my subject to study for university, that's the main one which stood out to me. So it wasn't until fourth year when I found out about chasing, I kind of really got quite passionate about it I was able to incorporate like my painting background. I start my process with going on walks 
among nature and making drawings, sketches of anything I see, taking photos. So I, that's a really enjoyable part. And then actually getting into the making and seeing your design come to life as well. I think I, I do enjoy the chasing the most. It's kind of, you can just sit there for hours. It's kind of quite relaxing. It's kind of like a form of meditation, I guess. So it, do, it is time consuming, but I really enjoy it. Equally, I guess, having the finished piece as well and to share that with others is quite a rewarding feeling as well. So, yeah. I guess this collection is a certain style of chasing. It's quite different to what I've done before for my degree show anyway. It was um, quite abstract textures around nature and kind of zoomed in, yeah, patterns, details. Whereas I'm kind of being a bit more literal and it's kind of a lot more intricate detail, like a storytelling theme going on, magical fairy tale kind of pieces as well. One of the dishes in the exhibition, the large nature dish, um, that took a full month to chase. So with this um, certain style of chasing for this one, I've kind of tried to bring elements to life um, by pushing all this background down around here and then also pushing parts um, out from the other side as well to create you know, more of that three-dimensional effect. Um, and then, yeah, I had to create a lot of different kind of chasing tools for this piece. Large planishing ones to cover the, the surface, as well as like tiny little tools for the details. You can see if you have a closer look. The daisies in the fields, and um, we've got some nice like kind of car cow parsley, a four leaf clover as well, uh, some thistles, a dandelion, uh, you've got the wild wildflowers. I quite like having all the kind of different hidden elements to this piece. The more you look at it, the more you kind of see. Because all my work's kind of based on nature and the outdoors, so anyone who's interested in that, who has similar interests as me, I guess, going for nice walks and stuff. And uh, part of my work is kind of creating a feeling I get from a walk and kind of put it into a piece. So I hope that the person who likes the piece kind of feels the passion and feels like they're in the outdoors when they view the piece. Yeah, bringing it into their homes so is kind of bringing the outdoors in. Welcome this evening, Katie. It's fantastic to have you here um, and to see um, some examples of your beautiful chaste work. Um, you've been studying over the last year and developing your practice at Bishop's Land. Could you tell us um, a little bit about how you developed um, as a maker and how um, that practice has evolved during that time that you have spent at Bishop's Land? Yeah, uh, so Bishop's Land has been a really good opportunity for me um, over the past year. Um, it created a lot of opportunities um, doing various masterclasses um, I was lucky enough to go up to Shetland to work with Rod Kelly, um, who's a master chaser, um, and he taught me a lot, not just chasing, silversmithing skills as well, large-scale soldering, um, which I've implemented in a lot of my um, pieces. Um, as well as the master classes, we had various competitions, and um, so I was also lucky enough to um, win money to make one of my pieces. Um, it was the Circle of Life dish which is in um, my most, most recent collection. And so I wouldn't have been able to make something as large scale as that otherwise. So it was a really good option to say. Um, and I was in Bishop's Land during lockdown as well. Um, so it, re it allowed me to focus a lot um, and because you're living there as well. Um, so yeah, it, it really helped a lot. And you obviously built on what you had um, learned at university, but evolved your your process there. I was interested that you went from the more abstract to the more um, figurative. How did how did that come about? Um, I guess just through different inspirations. Um, and when I first when I made the land and sea vase, um, which was one of the first pieces. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get it in the right light. <laughs> it's beautiful. I quite like um, yeah, doing all the details um, yeah. and creating a kind of landscape and kind of um, more of a story to the piece. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Was it um, was it inspired by a particular place when you were making it? Yeah, so a lot of my work is inspired by my hometown in North America in Scotland, um, on the East Coast. Um, and I always go back to my hometown um, because it's got both the countryside landscapes and the seaside as well. Um, so I wanted to capture that in this piece in the land in uh, sea vase. Um, and I kind of made it the cylindrical vase form um, so I could have like the above and below kind of a, the land and sea mm. aspect as well. Yeah, yeah, um, you've got the, you've got the yeah, <laughs> the light's not, it's difficult with the light, but yeah, you have very clearly got the beautiful fish under the sea. We've got some great pictures um, online so people can see it more. And then um, if you show that underneath as well, I kind of like to have Certainly, the yeah. surprises where the fish is swimming around as well. And um, oh, yeah. so it kind of intrigues the viewer more and um, turning it around um, and kind of creating a movement to the piece like with the fish yeah. in as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> it does have a really beautiful flow around it, the way you have um, applied the pattern. And for those of you who can't see in detail, there are these beautiful um, shoals of fish swimming around it. Thank you, Katie. It's wonderful um, to be able to share your work um, this evening. And I should say that for any of you um, who would like to see more, obviously, if you go to um, the, the Goldsmith Centre website and the shop, you'll be able to see um, all of these collections that we're um, previewing with you this evening online. Thank you, Katie. So now we're going to um, be welcoming Megan Brown and um, Isabel is going to kindly play Megan's film. Thank you. Hello, my name is Megan and I'm a contemporary jeweller. I have made all of my pieces in this workshop based in North Yorkshire. I'm really excited to share with you today my brand new jewellery collection, which I've been working on over lockdown. It's actually inspired by my family's textile mill in Leeds, which has been in our family for generations. Looking back, I think this has really influenced me as a designer and maker, inspiring my appreciation of tradition and craftsmanship. I wanted to do this by exploring the process of weaving, which would later influence the overall look and feel of this collection. I began making sample squares, but soon found that I couldn't get a uniform weave with this process. I began experimenting with chains, as I thought they would move more like threads, giving a lovely fluid quality to my work. I also found that I was able to create a much finer weave, which was a big turning point in my process. I began making the frames in flowing shapes to give the impression of movement, with hanging chains to represent the loose threads, like selvage from a loom. My initial piece I created was the woven hoop. By opening out the circle and curling it behind the ear, it created a sense of illusion which I then channeled into my later pieces. The colours and patterns I've used are all influenced by traditional weaving. For example, the blanket earrings, which are named after a cloth woven with differing panels of colour combinations in one piece of fabric. I finished the piece with clusters of chains to give the idea of tassels which move beautifully as you wear them. The woven ring is created in such a way that the weaving actually gives a structure to the piece as well as being a decorative element which I really like. Because I only use very fine wires and chain with my designs, they're actually very light, almost like wearing fabric. I feel like I've really captured what I was trying to create which was the qualities of fabric, but in metal. Welcome, Megan. Um, and there you are in your beautiful um, barn studio. Um, your collection is so closely tied to your family history and this idea of weaving. And I, I find it quite extraordinary how you've managed to capture the idea of cloth in metal. It's a real, real feat. And I can see in the chat people saying things like beautiful. So, and I completely agree. Um, could you possibly tell us a little bit about your journey into making and um, how you how you came to um, become a jeweller? Well, actually, um, I started out um, studying fashion um, and 
I came about the jewellery at an unusual angle because I had to take the year out because of glandular fever. But um, it kind of opened up opportunities to try out different practices and gave the opportunity to work with a local jeweller who really inspired my passion for jewellery making. And this kind of um, led to me making pieces for myself, which ended up getting so much um, attention that I decided to start a business and making, making jewellery. Um, yeah, no, it was um, kind of an unexpected turn of events and I don't think it would have happened if um, things hadn't planned out that way. But I just love the craftsmanship of jewellery and I've been really inspired by it. And it's really, with this collection, it's really transpired into um, a really beautiful piece. Of mm. And um, I mean, I um, am absolutely struck by these stunning blanket earrings here, which you can see the wonderful way in which they, they wiggle, as you say, like the salvage. Could you tell us a little bit about how you went um, about designing them? What was your, what was your process um, well, in terms of like... They are actually inspired by blankets at the mill. And I've actually got one of the fabrics here. So I thought it would be quite easy to see it. So at the mill, they create these pieces of fabric to test out colours and pattern ways. And it's all done on one loom. So it creates the panel-like colours. I think you can see them. But, yeah. um, so that really inspired the panels in the weaving. Yeah. So it's got the oxidised silver at the top. And I've hand-woven those with the sterling silver below to give that panelling. And then with the tassels, I wanted to kind of keep with the idea of the blanket. So I've kind of clustered them together. So the way that they hang is really unusual. And um, it kind of really represents the collection quite well because it's really the chain, using the chain with the weaving was really what kind of um, was quite exciting for because uh, I did lots of testing to develop the pieces and the chains was the turning point. So weaving by hand with the chain. And then, um, it kind of creates a proper feeling of fabric, which is what I really wanted to create. Mm -hmm. And it's really light weight and it has a lovely texture that when it catches the light, it's almost like little, all the like little diamonds, the way it kind of, it really twinkles and sparkles because it's all faceted. It's really, it's kind of an unusual texture that kind of, it looks amazing when worn. Yeah. I think it's quite remarkable to be able to achieve in metal that idea of the warps and wefts um, that you get in a fabric. Um, yeah. They are really beautiful. I find it really satisfying to do the weaving. I think I've always been, um, yeah, drawn to the finer details of things. So it kind of, for me, it's, yeah, I really like the process of making each piece as well as the final result. Thank you, Megan. Um, it's wonderful to hear from you this evening. So um, our next maker is Caitlin, and I'm going to take in Hegney, who's up in Scotland, and I'm going to share um, Caitlin's film now and um, then pass over to Isabel, who is going to talk to you. My name is Caitlin Hegney and I'm a jewellery artist based in Helensborough on the west coast of Scotland about an hour from Glasgow. I am lucky enough to be designing and making from my home studio at the bottom of my garden. I create handmade jewellery from precious metal and wood that resonates with our ancient heritage. So the story behind my collection stems from my interest in our ancient history. The collection that I've made for Shine 2020 I've called Ditto because it's exploring the connections that we have in the present to our past. I've focused particularly on rhythmic markings that have transcended generations. I think I'm drawn to them because of their ambiguity, all the things that we don't know about them. So why these markings are here, who left them behind and what they mean. I'm fascinated by this ambiguity and I almost visualise it as a language that's transcended the generations from our ancestors right through to the present day. And the sort of sources that I've looked at to research these markings have been through studying ancient hordes and looking to 
old artefacts and also stone carvings and um, there are still traces that are left behind to this day. So my practice moves between 2D and 3D. I always start off by drawing, working on paper with pigment, pencils and pens. I then start to move my drawings into the three dimensions by working with ancient craft techniques into wood and into precious metal. The techniques that I use themselves are very rhythmic and are very meditative to complete. I create hand forged tools that replicate the markings that I make in 2D on paper. I'm inspired and take elements from a traditional technique called chasing to use these tools to emboss pattern into the surface of precious metals. I also build up pattern by forging wire and the reason I use this process is because it's, it's quite expressive which helps me capture that quality of my initial drawings in 2D. The most challenging piece from this collection for me I think would be the Ovid Cadence brooch. Each line for this piece has been individually forged and soldered into place. So it was a real challenge for me learning how much I could push heat when soldering to make all the elements stay together but without overheating and melting another part of the brooch. However, it has been really rewarding to put together, especially when you see it on the body and the light catches the edges of the silver as the wearer is moving. My jewellery has a very classic look about it. It looks as if it should almost belong to an ancient hoard, but it resonates with the contemporary wearer. It remains modern for wearing today. Welcome Caitlin. Um, I think you're calling in from Scotland, which is wonderful. And I'm so fascinated by the uh, inspiration behind your collection. It's absolutely beautiful. I uh, just wondered if you could give us a little bit more idea how you got inspired to actually get into jewellery and, and what's your, um, what your studies were. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that I've always been one of those people that was probably destined to do something with my hands. I was always fiddling about with things and collecting things. Um, and when I discovered that going to art school was an option for me it was just about exploring different disciplines until I found something that really resonated with me and really I think what drew me to jewellery in the end was actually the workshop and the that environment is kind of you know really dirty and lots of kind of hands-on things touchy-feely things that you want to play with um, but really for me it was it was the fact that that hadn't changed you know you really got this sense that you were almost stepping back in time by being in this workshop and the fact that the techniques and the tools that we use today are still virtually unchanged um, throughout the way that they've been in history I think really drew me towards the subject and I fell, the first workshop I fell in love with was the one that I studied at in, in art school, which was at the Glasgow School of Art. Um, yeah, and ever since then, it's just been about me building that up um, since graduating and, and now starting my own business. Fantastic. And it's really interesting how your pieces are so timeless as well. And um, I'm also absolutely fascinated by the way you use blue in your pieces. And I know that has quite a, a big significance. And I've got a wonderful piece here, your blue cadence necklace, which I hopefully you can all see um, just catching in the light. It's absolutely stunning. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, why blue and how do you go about making a piece like this, this one? Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, the, the colour blue for me, it's, it's a funny one because it wasn't something, it wasn't, you know, if you asked me a few years ago what my favourite colour was, I would never have said blue. Um, so I would say it's actually more of a, a fascination and possibly an addiction I don't know um, but the more again that I was researching about the colour um, I kind of I, I fell into a, and turned a little bit of a rabbit hole actually but with regards to the history of the colour again and for me it was the fact that this colour could carry a meaning of value and this was due to um, some folklore that 
comes from ancient history that's traveled across the world, which told us that um, blue pigment was once more expensive to buy and import and export from a country than gold. And for me, because I was always really interested in the duality of working between precious materials and my non-precious materials, which are the wood, um, I almost use the color blue as a way to attribute value to a material that otherwise has no monetary value, but is exceptionally unique in its own right. Um, so for me, that was why it was the colour blue. And yeah, and then since then, it's been this really unusual relationship I've had with it, trying to um, get the most vivid and um, alluring blues that I can get and put it into my jewellery. Brilliant. And it's very, very lightweight as well. I think it's just the, um, the materials that you use. So it looks quite heavy, but actually it's really lightweight, which is, which is fantastic. Thank you so much, Caitlin. That's really, really interesting. Um, and I would love to introduce uh, jeweller Katarina Krauss as the next um, jeweller. And thanks for playing the film. My name is Katarina Krauss, and I'm a jewellery designer, maker, and curator. The collection I'll be showing at Shine is called Solasta. It means early morning twilight. The collection is inspired by the architecture of cityscapes and the colours of the gemstones are inspired by the different colours of the sky, from the soft pink in the early morning to a dark midnight blue. So in this collection there is a lot of pink opal, rhodolite and garnet, and also pale milky blue, chalcedony and darker blues like sapphire and iolite. Drawing is the first step in my design process. I often sketch ideas 20 to 30 times to explore all angles and ideas. And I find inspiration in the gemstones I source. Sometimes you look at a stone and you know immediately if it wants to be a ring, a necklace or a pair of earrings. All my pieces are handmade by myself uh, from start to finish and this is my workshop. And I share it with two other jewelers, and this is our fantastically creative and chaotic space. The most challenging piece to make from the collection was the pink on pink ring. It's the first stone that I shaped myself. The stone had to fit exactly inside the setting. And I was going very slowly because I was worried that I was going to break the stone or file too much off. But now it's also the piece in the collection that I'm most proud of because the cushion shape of the pink opal contrasts so well with the more angular kite shape of the rhodolite. The collection constantly evolves with each piece that I make and with each gemstone that I source. I am now at the stage where I look at all the pieces I already have so that the next piece uh, which I make fits in with the overall theme. In the beginning of a collection it's much freer because I get to go where inspiration takes me and now it's like a puzzle. The first few pieces are the cornerstones and now everything has to fit in and fill a gap. <laughs> My jewellery is all about different types of light reflection in gemstones. I combine regularly cut gemstones, which are cut for maximum light reflection and sparkle, with hand cut gemstones that have a much softer, warmer light reflection. And I combine these stones for the subtle contrast in the light reflection when the piece is worn. Hi Katerina. Well, first of all, congratulations. You've just been nominated as well for the Jewelry Cut Live Bursary, which is absolutely wonderful Thank news. Um, I would love to find out a little bit more. You've got such a fascination with gemstones and how you just got into the jewellery trade and a bit about your journey. Honestly, I don't think I ever had a choice of not becoming a jeweller and the fascination for gemstones has um, has has been there from the beginning. So I was born and raised in Munich and we have in Hogenta, which is the trade show. And um, my mother used to have a jewelry friend and she would come every year for in Hogenta. And I was uh, the designated bag carrier because that was the days when you would go to a trade show and you would buy 
um, your stock for the whole year. And I just remember entering like the first halls and there was just so much sparkle and so much stone. And honestly, I that was the moment where I was like, yep, this is the material I want to work with and uh, haven't looked back since. Fantastic. And then you went on uh, studying in, in the UK yes. and in Europe. Yeah. Yes. So I'm a very classically trained German jeweler with a lot of focus on how to make things. Um, I'm also a trained uh, master craftsman or master craftswoman in this case, um, but that was all very focused on the technical sides of making. And for me, creativity was really missing. So I uh, later went on to study um, jewelry design at Central St. Martins, uh, where I graduated with a MNA and later launched my own jewelry collection, which was two years ago. Brilliant. And I've got a lovely, lovely piece here, which are your flight earrings. I feel really honoured yes. holding these because they're absolutely stunning. Um, you. Can you tell me a little bit about the uh, inspiration behind these and how you go about making, making these earrings? Mm -hmm. So um, these are inspired, uh, these are pieces from my collection Solasta, which is inspired by the different colours of the sky. And these are clearly inspired by the dark um, black of the night sky. Um, so it has a very dark um, a black onyx in it, which is kind of the darkest part of the night, but it is paired with a um, shimmering kunzite, which um, is more um, reflective of the twilight and the moment uh, where day turns into night. And for me, the inspiration came by combining um, these two stones and um, they're set in silver um, to give it a bit of a lighter backing as well. So it's darker, dark blue tones set in silver to kind of bring a stronger contrast to it. Beautiful. They're absolutely stunning. And you can, if you haven't got them in front of you, but the colours are really, really gorgeous. All the blues that you've got in there. Thank you so much, Katerina. And um, I'd love to welcome next uh, Daisy Grice, who's in, in Birmingham. And we'll, um, Charlotte will play her film. Thank you. Hi, I'm Daisy, designer, maker and everything at Daisy Grice Jewelry. Welcome to my workshop. For Shine 2020, I will be exhibiting my multi-award winning Twisted Tales collection. Twisted Tales was my debut collection, so it was really it gave me the chance to show who I wanted to be as a designer maker. I've always been fascinated and really inspired by the armour and the costumes worn in fantasy films, as well as dark hawkature fashion. I've always been drawn to elements which a lot of people might find sort of dark or peculiar or even disturbing sometimes. Um, but for me, it's always really beautiful. So my work is, you know, I often look at things like skeletal structures, so skulls. Um, I love the way the vertebrae moves. Um, I also look at um, natural forms of defence, so, um, you know, claws and fangs um, and scales as well. One of my favourite parts of being a designer maker is definitely the design process. Um, so it's really exciting time, um, but it's also quite a long process sometimes. The way I start is by um, combining all of my inspiration, um, it, as you put it into a mood board, and then start selecting lines and shapes that I'm finding really interesting. Um, I'll then start putting them into the sketchbook. So I do a lot of abstract hand drawing, and it's then I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll start sort of like building them up with ink and making them a bit more three dimensional. But it's important for me that I don't do like a t technical drawing because. I want the rest of the processes that follow to still be um, creative and still be pushing the boundaries of the design. When I'm then happy with the uh, 2D drawing, I then move on to model making. I usually use wax carving for this. I then take it onto the computer and do a mock-up of the um, piece to scale. But at this point, it's still not usually a jewelry piece. It's often a sculpture. At that point, once I kind of make the sculpture, I will then start chopping it up layering it on top of each other, adding new bits. Um, and that's when it gets really exciting for me because to be able to have that opportunity where you can take one shape and sort of manipulate it to be something else is really exciting. The most challenging piece that I've had to make so far is definitely the one of a kind Twisted Tales statement neck collar. When I made this piece, I was quite new to using computer aided design. So having to sort of go from making models by hand and having them in front of you to actually then seeing them in front of you but not being able to hold them was quite a different sort of way of working and it was quite a hard thing to overcome because obviously this piece being so large 
um, it's sculpted to the neck. So you don't have a neck on the computer, really. It has to be done by measurements. The other thing also is made of um, sintered nylon. So it's extremely lightweight to use. But unlike metal, when you print something in nylon, you can't actually edit it. So you can't file away at it because it's so hard. You can't drill into it. So whatever you've done on the software needs to be exactly what you want to come out at the other end. So although this was the most challenging, it was probably the most rewarding piece to make um, because it's got me a lot of recognition. And when I look at it being the designer, um, it's exactly what I wanted it to convey. A really warm welcome to you this evening, um, Daisy. It's lovely to have you here. Um, you're based in Birmingham. Could you tell us a little bit about um, your journey into making? And just before I say that, I must say it's so wonderful to see your extraordinary sketchbooks. That's been one of my highlights of you making these films, all of you, because you get to delve into what you, what you do behind the scenes. But yes, how did you get into making, Daisy? So um, I've always been really creative anyway when I was younger, um, but I was actually born into a family of um, artisan blacksmiths. So I went with my grandpa to his forge um, and I had a go at that, but it was, it's quite hard work. I don't know if anyone else has ever tried it, but um, I wanted to sort of use those skills, but make it in something that people would actually wear um, and sort of cherish. So I um, then did an evening class um, back in my hometown in Cambridgeshire. And um, it was then that she told me about the Birmingham School of Jewellery, so I um, applied to that and got in. Um, so I then spent two years there, which was doing a um, jewellery and silversmithing course. So um, in my work, I do use the computer aided design, but I'm also um, trained at the bench as well, so I like to combine both. Um, so once I'd done the h and I then worked for um, design and maker Paul Spurgeon. So um, he taught me to wax carve over the summer. Um, and then whilst I was working with him, I got a lot of industry experience and I then went on and decided that I wanted to do it for myself. So I then applied back to Birmingham for the third year of the degree, um, which was the computer design. Um, and yes, yeah, so I went and did that um, and I've stayed in Birmingham since. So I've got a workshop that I share with other designers here and um, yeah, it's been really exciting. So I launched um, Place for Us Jewelry in 2018 and have sort of gone on from there. Fantastic. And I know that, um, well, this, your, your fang motif is um, you've evolved in such an interesting range of ways um, into different pieces for your Twisted Tales collection. Could you tell us a little bit about this in particular piece? Um, it combines three different materials with the, I mean, especially the black diamonds, I know was a new development for you. So I wonder if you might just tell us a little bit about this design. Yes, so the um, fang pendant that Charlotte's got there is my favourite piece um, that's sort of wearable every day. So um, with the big neck piece that was shown earlier, I actually took an element that I really liked from that and um, made the pendant. So I basically combined both sides because I really like symmetrical design. Um, and I started off um, with making pieces like this pendant I'm wearing now, which is just the plain nylon and um, full silver ones. And then I thought, why not combine it all? Um, because that pendant for me is sort of the heart of the collection. It offers the sort of lightweight matte black nylon, but it's contrasted with this highly polished um, solid sterling silver. So it's got sort of two combinations of weight, texture and colour. And then to finish it off, it's got the uh, black diamonds down the centre. And that's a really nice contrast because it's sort of a contrasting value of materials as well. Um, and yeah, I'm a lover of everything black. So that's why I was kind of drawn to the nylon as a material to use. So. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, a really nice piece. Of that that I also, to... oh, sorry, Charlotte. <laughs> that piece also, um, along two other pieces, was the winner of the um, Gold Swiss Awards as well. So it was nice to sort of show that one design can be made in so many different sort of combinations. Yes, and for different tastes at different scales. I think that's what's really um, lovely about what you've done with it. But um, I was really excited when I saw that you'd included the black diamonds because they're such a perfect combination with the nylon. Really, it's fantastic. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly in the value. And it's, yeah, it just adds a bit of spark in conjunction to that. So. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Daisy. So um, now we're going to meet Sarah Sheldon Palmer and um, Isabel's going to kindly play her film. I'm Sarah and I'm a jeweller and silversmith. 
I'm a big surfer, that's my passion. Um, and it's when I'm out actually surfing and I spend most of my time down at the coast, um, that's things that I'll notice, it's the movement of the water. Um, and when I come, when I'm walking in the beach, it's the, the traces that the water leaves behind on the sand and in the rocks. And um, I collect a lot of stuff from the beach and I've got jars of sea glass and all sorts of rocks. I'm going to talk you through my Chasing Waves collection. Um, so when I'm designing something, it usually starts off with a quick sketch just to get the idea out of my head before I forget what I'm doing. So um, it's usually something like this. Um, you can see it's just really quick sketches, seeing where the pencil moves and getting an idea of, of shape. Um, then I'll start doing a little bit more research. I'll be looking at um, drawing lines and uh, textures, pictures, which are, I find inspiring particularly like this little wave drawing, it's got lots of lines and shape and it really picks out the movement of, of the waves and the water. This is my Chasing Waves craft, which has probably been the most challenging piece that I've made um, since I started this collection. Um, it was a different shape to try and raise, so that was the first um, challenge and then obviously chasing it um, with the neck coming in at the top meant that I had to keep the inside really clean, um, which I, I did. I've had it gold plated as well on the inside um, because it's, if it's going to be having wine in it, it needs to have a gold plate to stop the silver tarnishing. I enjoy the making. Um, immensely, that's my you know my favourite bit. Say like I'm I'm making um, a beaker and I've i raised it up, so it's exciting after every round measuring how far it's gone out and then the cleaning and the polishing and then you're applying the texture. I can almost imagine like I'm I'm surfing when I'm using the tool on the on the object. It's kind of moving the way it moves from like carving along. Some of my designs are quite bold, um, so they might. You know, appeal to people that like a, a bolder design um, but then I try and put some sort of delicate textures and stuff so it, I think I'm hoping it can appeal to um, yeah, lots of people. Warm well, welcome this evening Sarah, um, lovely to have you here. Um, it's interesting how closely your hobby, um, your surfing passion, um, you managed to replicate so well in your work. It has such amazing energy in terms of how you um, work with the metal. Can you tell us how um, you got into silver smithing? Um, Thank you. Um, sorry, can you just say, I, um, I couldn't quite make up that, the question. Just really your journey into becoming a silversmith. Um, how oh, did that sorry. start? Um, yeah, so I, I was traveling. I was actually uh, um, in Central America and I, I always like to collect um, some sort of object um, to take home as a sort of, you know, keepsake. Um, and I ended up working with... Um, a little person, little guy in a little workshop in Central America, and I made a little silver ring, and um, it just sparked something to make something 3D to keep. Um, so when I got came back to Cornwall, I decided to um, apply to do a degree in silver smithing and jewellery, and and it just sparked a love for for making um, with found objects and inspiration being the coasts and stuff um yeah it's just spiraled on from from there so yeah and you um like katie have been honing your skills at bishop's land and stayed on um, yes. as the maker of residence yes. didn't you how has how has yes. that helped you to evolve your practice over the last years? Uh, massively it's helped me immensely um you know we had lockdown at bishop's land which i was really thankful to still be able to work and, and create and carry on with my practice. So I really concentrated on chasing and um, making, raising and chasing are the two things that I was just drawn to. Um, but it just, yeah, it just gave us, gave me the opportunity to really learn as much as I could about, about silversmithing um, and also making bits of jewellery to fit alongside the collections. Mm. I feel very lucky to have, yeah, had that opportunity. Yeah. 
And with me this evening, I have um, your beautiful oyster caddy spoon, which um, yeah. you see the wonderful decoration in this, in this light. Could you tell us a little bit about um, this particular piece? So shells are sort of things that one of the three, I've got boxes of shells um, and all sorts of things. And I just loved the shape. And it, for a tea caddy spoon, um, I thought the scoop is actually quite like, a, you know, like an oyster or a mussel shell, something like that. Um, so I formed it um, by sort of sinking the centre bit. And then, um, yeah, I just bent the metal round um, with a wooden um, stake and then uh, the texture is applied by a little chasing tool that I acquired um, and it was just a, all about water and light shimmering, shimmering on the surface of the ocean um, and I thought it went quite well with the shape um, so it was yeah, it, this an experiment really that turned it into a little caddy spoon yeah well, the, it certainly, the decoration is so wonderful, the way it reflects the light in different oh, ways. And, the, and yeah. the very elegance of the, of the shape. It's very lovely to yeah. hold. I'm sorry that um, okay. us not being together at the centre in an actual exhibition means that you, you don't get the opportunity to hold it. But, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wonderful <laughs> Thank piece. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the, um, thank you, Sarah. The next... Thanks, um, Make maker um, I'd love to welcome this evening is Yiling Wang, who is joining us um, all the way from China, which is where um, our present lockdown has um, has left her. <laughs> um, although Yiling seems to have disappeared from the screen, which is slightly worrying. Shall we move on to Lindsay, and then we will try and reclaim um, Yiling all the way from China? Um, so Isabel. Thank Are you, you okay to play Lindsay's film? Yes, yeah, so I'll introduce Lindsay and um, I'll play a film now. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Lindsay Bowie. I'm a contemporary jeweller based in Edinburgh. So the name of the collection is Namara, um, which means of the sea in Gaelic, um, which references really where my inspiration comes from. Lots of my inspiration comes from walks that I've done along the east coast of Scotland. Um, so I visited beaches like Ely and Cranand and North Queensferry. And I was particularly interested in lots of the debris that gets washed up and deposited on the beaches there. None of it's permanent and it's all sort of left there by accident. Um, like it's deposited by the waves and it'll be washed away again the next day and it will never be like that again. And I just think that's a really beautiful concept. So this sketchbook is full of mixed media drawings which are all based on compositions that I've found um, along different sections of the Scottish coast. Um, I use these drawings mostly just to explore compositions and surface texture and um, so combining different materials and um, just to play with that and create something quite tactile. One of the drawings that I've ended up using the most in this collection is this one. So I use this as a reference for lots of the mark making that goes into my jewellery, including lots of the scored and folded wire pieces, like the ones that I'm wearing now as well, and also the photo etched pieces as well, which have been enamelled. The enamel in my earrings are also um, hand formed into tube after they've been photo etched and before enamelling um, and the way that the findings are attached um, they're riveted um, to give this lovely sense of movement when you're wearing them as well. For this collection I guess because it's quite sort of some, piece, some of the pieces are quite sort of bold and graphic and sort of quite androgynous someone who's interested in sort of unique pieces to be interested in these ones. So um, also with, with lots of the pieces, um, even if they sort of share the same aesthetic style, the pattern in each one is unique. So with some of the wire inlay pieces, the pattern that's laid down each time by me is different. So even if you're buying the same sort of tube earrings, um, there'll be no two pairs which are the same. Because it's all based on these found compositions at the coast, uh, which are all unique. Um, I think it's important to kind of keep that spontaneity and sense of chance in my work.
Hi, Lindsay. Welcome. Hi. I, I love your pieces. They're just gorgeously sculptural and all the influence with those found um, found objects in the foreshore as well is absolutely fascinating. I just was really interested uh, just to start off and just find out how you got into, into jewellery design and where your journey yeah. started. Um, so I guess I'd always been um, interested in drawing and making things, but it was only when um, I was doing uh, an art foundation in Falmouth that I sort of got into it by accident, really. Um, I took part in one of the workshops there. Um, and then I, I just ended up um, basing my, my collection for my diploma um, on that course. So I ended up actually making a collection of jewellery there based on the coast in Falmouth. So my work's changed a lot since then, but I guess I've always been interested in the coast. And you, and you live very close to it as well. I can imagine you can go out and get inspiration for your beautiful sketchbooks. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was great. <laughs> That's wonderful. I'm also really, really pleased to actually show a brooch tonight. Uh, we've got one of your lovely inlay brooches. And hopefully you can see that at home. It's absolutely stunning. Can you tell me a little bit about where the inspiration for this particular piece came from and also how you create them? Because it's a really fascinating surface texture on these. Yeah, so um, all of my inspiration comes from yeah, walks that I've done along the beaches. So um, I'm really interested in all the kind of bits of debris that gets washed up. So like bits of seaweed and um, knotted rope and sort of rusted iron bits. And from those, um, I I also do lots of abstract drawings um, in monochrome normally just to kind of fix on the, the texture and form. Um, so this piece uh, starts off as um, sheet and gilding metal wire. Uh, which is quite fine so it allows me to be quite expressive with it so that's all laid out by hand and then formed into tube and um, before being shaped um, and then at the end it's also given this patina um, which changes the gilding metal from this kind of bronze color into the really bold black that you can see there um, and then the ends of this tube as well um, they're also set with um, like a reverse set onyx cabochon so um, it's just sort of little hidden detail there as well I love how they're none of them are the same, are they? You, as you said in the film, they all yeah. with a slightly different pattern, which you can see on this one as well, which is which is really yeah, each different. pattern's completely unique. Yeah, mm. brilliant. Yeah, well, I've, I've hopefully I'd love to see this on someone as well. It's absolutely stunning. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much, you. Lindsay. <laughs> really interesting. Thanks. Great. <laughs> um, I'm going to now introduce uh, Heidi Carpie. Um, and she, I think, is on screen as well. So thank you, Charlotte, for playing her film. Hello, I'm Heidi Carthew, and I am a jeweller and metalsmith living and working in Cornwall. I have lived in Cornwall all my life, and I have definitely been inspired by the Cornish coastline and I bring a lot of that inspiration into my work. And I'm also heavily inspired by Scandinavian design, sort of the minimalism of it all. So the Athena collection um, is a collection of homeware made from pewter and jesmonite, and also um, a collection of jewellery, which is made from majority recycled silver and um, Jasmineite too, so jasmineite features heavily within my work. And I use that material because it allows me to bring colour and texture um, and a more sort of playful feel within my pieces. So I've named my collection Athena because it means adorn um, in Cornish, and a lot of my pieces, um, for example, the Tegan Moore earrings and necklace. Um, are named using Cornish words or inspired by the Cornish language and I think that was mainly just to just as a little nod to my heritage really. And Tegenmoor means beautiful sea and as you can probably see I am constantly bringing uh, the colours of the coastline so the blues and whites and greys of the rocks um, into my pieces. And I use the technique of scoring 
scoring and folding to create my vessels. So this one here is the Deveri Pot, um, which is a self-watering planter, and it's made up of two elements, so the jesmonite bowl and the pewter top, and it has cotton string which allows the plant to draw up water as and when it needs it. I've designed it so that um, you can easily pour the water to the bottom vessel um, through the spout here. And I think this one is probably my most challenging piece to date and I think that's just because of the amount of pieces it's um, comprised of. So um, the top here is made up of seven pieces all with different angles and different shapes um, but yeah it's the challenge that I absolutely love. My aim is to create pieces that people want to keep for a lifetime and pieces that they can adorn themselves with and their home. Hello Heidi, welcome. Hello. Um, I find your pieces absolutely fascinating because you've got quite practical, usable pieces, which are your beautiful pots. But um, I know that you've had quite a journey working with pewter and jasmineite. Can you give us a little bit more of an idea how you got to start working with this material and where you did your training? Um, well, I started um, working with pewter when I started an apprenticeship um, when I was around 19, I think it was, um, with a local jeweller. Um, and he worked a lot with... Um, cast pewter pieces and resin so I think um yeah I didn't really piece this connection together until um the training with you but um yeah I think the combination with colour and um the gorgeous colour of pewter which is slightly different to silver I think it's um got that slightly darker tone and I think it just the contrast between that and the colour in jesmonite is um is what I really love yeah and but, um, for those who don't know what jesmonite is, could you give us a little bit more of an understanding about that material? Yeah, so it's similar to resin, um, but it's a two-part material. So there's um, there's a powder and there's a liquid that you mix together um, and then you pour into moulds. So I create all of my moulds myself. Um, I've actually got one of them here, which I've used the piece that you've got there. <laughs> Yeah, so you've got your lovely necklace here, um, so you can see that's that beautiful blue that you just mentioned, um, yeah. that you've, that you've uh, just described, the jasmine. Yeah, so how do you go about making that? You've got the moulds that you, you pour that into. Yes, so um, I create models, usually um, using copper or pewter, so I almost get like a finished piece to start with. Um, and then I use that to create silicon moulds. So this one here. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I experiment with jesmonite, so I've got a sample that you can see. Um, jesmonite, I, it gives me freedom, gives me um, freedom to sort of play with colour. Um, and I was experimenting with texture a little bit with these to start with, but it was just the, as I was playing with it all, it was just the marbling of the blues and the whites, I think was really interesting. Um, and I, it's something that I don't think you can often get with gemstones. And I think it's within this playful sort of experimentation that I realise, because usually I work in quite big scale, as you could probably see from the pots and the planters. But yeah, so it was during lockdown um, that I sort of really started to, ha started to have play. So that's where the jewellery came from, really. <laughs> Fantastic. And it is beautiful. I mean, you can hardly see the colours probably on the screen, but there's a lovely texture to your pieces. And I assume you could do them in any colour, can you? You've chosen blues and... and the yeah, screen. that's the great thing yeah. as well with jesmonite, yeah. because I um, I hand pigment all of the jesmonite. So, um, and I never really measure the colours, so I don't think I'll ever get the same colour again, really, which is quite nice. Um, and it's also why I've created that pendant to spin, because even on that pendant, the both sides are slightly different. So it gives you that sort of freedom to choose which one you want. That's wonderful. Well, really beautiful piece. And again, the use of blue, which we've seen quite a lot in a lot of your pieces tonight. So that's, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Heidi. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm really pleased to introduce Ellis May Woods and um, Charlotte will play her introductory video.
My name's Alice May Woods and I'm a silversmith and jeweller. The Caledonian collection is mainly inspired by architectural structures throughout Scotland. I've grown up in Scotland and I've always been drawn towards minimal modern architecture that I've experienced. So this collection is based around the three bridges across the Firth of Forth. I love how the three bridges are so different but they complement each other very nicely. I love the scale of these huge structures and how their forms completely transform as you travel across them or depending on where you're looking at them. So I wanted to capture that sense of movement and perception and distortion within my work. My design process is mostly led by making card models. Making the card models is my way of drawing and sketching to develop ideas. It allows me to create different shapes and forms to see what works well physically to then develop them on further and then start working in metal. My silverware is primarily made from using the technique scoring and folding. I make scoring tools from old worn files and create angles in the tips so I can then run that along the surface of the silver to create a channel which means I can fold the silver nicely and then solder it securely. This collection began as a collection of silverware and it's now developed into a small jewellery collection that runs alongside. I wanted to explore the ideas I had on a smaller scale um, to make wearable pieces. These chevron earrings were inspired by the newest bridge across the Firth of Forth, the Queensferry Crossing. I wanted to reflect the large white cables on the Queensferry Crossing but on a smaller scale. I love how these earrings are so lightweight and they're easy to wear every day and when the light hits off each individual wire that gives a subtle glow. I think someone who appreciates really minimal design, who can see the simplicity in my work as a statement, um, and maybe someone that's also from Scotland, who's got a relationship with the country um, and the places and the people, um, and that they would appreciate the a piece of work that's handcrafted and inspired by Scotland and made here. So welcome Alice, lovely to have you Hi, here this thanks. evening. Um, so your work is so tied to where you come from in Scotland, it's wonderful to see all those images that have inspired it, but um, in terms of your inspiration to become a maker, um, a silversmith and a jeweller. How, where did that come from? How did your journey start? Um, it started from when I was younger, really. I've always been quite creative and enjoyed working with any kind of material. So when I was younger, I used to make things from like plastic bottles and like cereal boxes and things like that. So I always knew that I wanted to be a maker, but I wasn't really sure what specifically so I enrolled in a portfolio course um, to basically just see working with different materials and what I was kind of more drawn towards so I was more drawn towards making kind of mini sculptural pieces and that led me in nicely to the silversmith and jewellery course at Glasgow School of Art so I studied there developing my ideas and designs and learning how to work in silver and gold. Um, and after that then was at Bishop Fund Educational Trust as well for a year, developing on and making bigger, bigger pieces and just gaining a bit of confidence and growing and finding my kind of style. And it is a really distinctive style. So I've got your first necklace here, which um, I just love the way you have connected all these parts into something that looks um, so angular and, and um, 
yeah, constructivist. Could you tell us a little bit about how you've um, how you've designed this particular necklace? Yeah, so this one was mainly inspired by the rail bridge across the fourth. So it's almost like a kind of big cage. So there's lots of lines going through and I just wanted to mimic that within a piece of jewellery. So I've used square wire to create the each individual form. So that's created sorry, the rectangles are created and then soldered together and then it's scored across an angle to then be folded up on itself to create that um kind of hollow form. So they're all then linked together. So then whenever mm. it's worn you can see through to see what kind of colour or fabric's worn underneath the way that you can see through the bridge. Yeah, it's very it's very satisfying. It's almost it's satisfying to wear and play with. <laughs> it's a really beautiful piece. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Alice. Wonderful. So um, it's wonderful to see that we have Yiling back with us. Isabel, can we can we go to um, Yiling next? Have you got her film lined up? So we'll play your film, Yiling, then I'll come. My name is Aileen Wong and I'm working as a jewelry designer and now I'm running my own um, jewelry brand called Misfits. I'm interested in jewelry industry but also uh, fashion industry. So I'm trying to explore and the boundary between those two areas. This collection, um, the inspiration of uh, is Siren. Um, is a uh, who, who is a um, mythological figure who seduced males on the passing ships. I think her beautiful voice also brings people fair. So it's like people love beautiful things, but at the same time, fair. The duality in the really inspires me a lot. So in the collection, I use very like chunky elements, very chunky chain. But uh, on the surface, I add some elements of like ripples and fish fins and like some very soft text and um, texture in, in like in the surface. And I think that's also like um, combine the tenderness and the like the, the roughness in this in, in one object. When I first designed it, I was using uh, 3D modeling to try to make, I didn't really think it, think it as a necklace, but I, but I actually think it as a like, 3D sculpture. I'm trying to make something like um, very beautiful itself rather than as a jewelry. So I want people to look at it, they think, oh, it's a really beautiful object. But when you wear it, it's also like suits you and um, like, very fashionable as well. This piece is challenging piece in the collection because it's this piece that it has two different finishing method in one piece. You can see that the three rings here are polishing finish and two of them are mud finished and also you can wear like this but also you can take the chain out and wear just like a tiny little very simple earring and the rest of the chain you can use it as a pendant so you have three ways to wear it i would love to design jewelry for independent women who has their own um, jewelry taste and they love their their life and they have like their own lifestyle So welcome, Yiling. <laughs> I'm so pleased that we um, were able to get you back. There were, I have to say thank you to colleagues behind the scenes, most particularly John East, who manages our business programs, who was busy peddling in the background <laughs> to, to bring you back. You're just on mute at the moment, so maybe you could unmute yourself, Yiling. <laughs> so 
you've had an interesting you've had an interesting learning um experience in that you've studied both in china but also at the royal college of arts in um in london could you tell us a little bit about um what inspired you um to become a jewelry designer and maker and that journey into your practice sure uh, I've been working as a silversmith and jewelry maker for nearly seven years since I entered my college in China. And after I finished a four-year study in China, I decided to um and I decided to um and continue to study as a master student in the College of Art. And I just graduated from the College of Art last year, last summer. And I will start to think about what I want to do in my next five years in my career. And I noticed that I have interest both on um, silversmith and also fashion industry. Because uh, as a, I also um, buy a lot of like earrings and, and rings from kind of like fashion brand rather than just um, craftsmen like and swordsmiths so I try to um I try to um explore the boundary between um, the craftsmanship and the fashion accessory industry and I also think um the fashion industry like some activities like fashion fashion week also bring more audience to craftsmanship and craftsmanship also brings more possibility for us to make the jewelry and fashion accessory longer lasting. So uh, I think in my next mm, three years, I will work on my own jewelry brand and try to combine the concept of fashion and craftsmanship. Mm. Yes, and, the, and you certainly do that in this um, this wonderful piece, which that kind of jewelry that when you have it on, you really know you have it on and it has an incredible and beautiful weight to it. Could This is your statement piece, isn't it, from the collection. Could you tell us a little bit about um, this necklace, Yuling? Yeah, and um, so this piece is the most significant piece in the collection. And in the video, I, um, I introduced the collection a little bit but um, you can see there's a um, very like very delicate texture on the surface of the chain, and each of the each of the look on the on the necklace the size is different. So when you look at it's quite chunky, but when you look closer, you can tell there's a lot of details on it. And I'm really interested on like combine the softness of the element I use like the ocean, the ripples and waves on a very like quite hard and powerful piece. And I think it can show the beauty of the power of women. And also when I, <laughs> and also uh, when I try to set up my own brand, I did a market research in China that I noticed that a lot of fashion brands in China are making very delicate delicate and small pieces. So I also want to offer a new aesthetic option for the women here. <laughs> you certainly do, you certainly do that. Thank you so much, Yuling. I'm so glad that we could um, get you back and speak to you this evening. Thank you, sorry. Just, just <laughs> and so, sorry about that. <laughs> you're, it's absolutely fine. Um, so um, last but not least, um, we're going to Francesca Acoli and um, Isabel Pipani Pega film. Thank you. My name is Francesca Suani. I'm a jewelry maker and designer from Italy. My collection is about an exploration of the Mokumigane technique. Mokumigane comes out of Japan and it's been used since the 17th century. Um, to make Japanese swords. Eventually, um, artists uh, took it to the next level and started making metal objects and also jewelry. In Japanese, mokumigari means wood grain, and the reason is because the final products um, look like exactly wood grain. And I'm going to show you. So here we see the very first 
step of the process, we have different sheets of metal. And usually there are different metals. For example, I have silver and palladium so that I have some contrasts of colors. And by stacking them, like here, I can obtain a sandwich, if you want to call it this way, of metals that eventually is going to be fused either with a torch or with a kiln. This is an example of a stack of metal, also called billet, after being fused with a torch. To have the stack of metals, I will need to hammer it or press it. And I'm going to do this in order to make sure that all the layers are bonded together. Then, what I will need to do is to use the rolling mill to slowly get to the desired thickness. I made this piece of metal and this pattern with this tool, a drill bit. The deeper I go, the more layers are going to be revealed. And the interesting part is to know how deep to drill or to carve. The key point of this collection, and in general of my way of working, is to leave some space to unpredictability. By making this jewelry, I would like to raise the question, what can the metal reveal? What's under the surface? It's amazing how, no matter how hard you try, you will never be able to make two pieces that look exactly the same. This means that every time I will make a jewelry piece with Mokumigane, it will be unique. And this also means that every time I will work with this technique, there will be some kind of surprise seeing the outcome. So a warm welcome to you, Francesca. Um, so I'm fascinating. So your, your pieces um, have the title mapping. Um, uh, within the collection and also there is this sort of mapping on the surface and these contours and your journey into making also encompassed visiting lots of different countries and learning in different places. Could you tell us a bit about that sort of that journey and that connection um, between the theme of your collection and then how it manifests itself in how you work? Of course. Um, so that piece is kind of like a bridge between two very important collections of mine. So one is um, um, the Mokumigane one that we're showing at Shine, and the other one is um, Knotted, uh, in which knots are the main focus. So you can see them all around the, uh, uh, the oval. So basically, um, the, the knots are a symbol of memory and um, kind of symbolize this and uh, each line, and it's kind of hard to see it from the, um, from the camera, but uh, the surface, I made uh, the pattern that I made with the Mokumigane technique um, shows like these kind of lines that could be like different paths or uh, yeah, possibilities that I, that I had during my journey. So um, in this contrast of the kind of possibilities and um, knots as memory kind of makes this piece as a, an amulet. And you can see on the other side that the uh, pattern is also um, different. Um, Let me show people that because I think whilst you're on screen, they don't get to see the other side. So you can see the knots around the edge. And also you've got these two different beautiful patterns exactly. created. There we are. And you carry on, Francesca. <laughs> on the other side, there is this kind of pattern where I wanted to kind of make a, um, a look of uh, like if the piece was kind of worn or old, so that uh, this kind of leaves some space to new stories uh, to make for the, uh, the for the wearer or for whoever looks at the piece. And that's kind of this kind of aesthetic is really kind of uh, a key point of my um, body of work. And more in general about the Mokumegane technique, um, I learned that um, in San Diego, uh, thanks to Anne Wolf, who taught me step by step all the different um, um, steps of the process. And that was in 2016. So before that, I, um, I did my bachelor degree in Florence in, at, at Kenya, where I was there for three years. And um, after that, I moved to, um, to the US for my master degree. 
and um, I was there for three years. Then I moved to um, San Diego, and that's where I learned the Mokumegane technique. And I did some other internships in the U.S. And then I, I ended up being in, uh, in the U.K., where I did a residency program at, in Birmingham at the School of Jewelry. And there I really had the chance to uh, experiment with this technique and really um, explore different metals and way of carving metals and how to make different patterns. Because I fell in love with this technique because really it offer, offers endless possibilities. And it's, yeah, I'm still amazed. <laughs> and um, after the UK, I moved to, uh, to Berlin where um, I'm working as a freelancer at the moment. It's interesting how your, how your work mirrors that kind of journey that you've taken through all your different learnings in different places and maps that out. Thank you so much, Francesca. Sorry. So I do apologize um, that we have overrun a tiny bit this evening, but I hope you will agree um, that it has been worth it to hear from all of our wonderful makers and um, to, to hear about their work, their inspirations, and um, how they came, came to um, be the, the cross people that they are today. So um, to close this evening's proceedings, I'm very pleased to welcome um, our Prime Warden at the Goldsmiths Company, Richard Fox, um, and invite him to, um, to say a few words. Richard, over to you. Well, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, I found that absolutely riveting and uh, quite fascinating. Um, uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, start to the, to the evening and the event. Uh, but I'd like to welcome everyone for joining this event uh, online and supporting uh, the launch of Shine 2020. Uh, and again, it, it really was a fascinating uh, way to introduce all the makers. Uh, it was enlightening, it was inspirational, revealing and enthralling. Uh, it was really blew me away with uh, some of the things that we're all doing. And I'm sure that's the same for everybody else that's participated. Um, as you're aware, it, it is new ter territory for us all. And um, I'd like to uh, thank all the Shine participants for sharing their work, their inspirations, and for embracing the opportunity to uh, participate in Shine so wholeheartedly in such difficult circumstances. And of course, I'd like to thank Isabel and yourself, Charlotte, uh, and all at the Centre for making this happen. I'm really impressed by the ability to hold such an event globally. Um, quite quite remarkable and not least for those those um, shine members that are international and especially Yilin whom it must be what two three o'clock in the morning for her so that shows the commitment from the makers so uh, you know that, that it's really really good um, on to other business uh, there are a couple of other uh, further meet the maker events on the 30th of September and the 5th of October uh, arranged in collaboration with the Goldsmiths Fair to profile the graduate fair participants, as well as the Shine uh, makers. So uh, please, for more information, visit the Goldsmiths Centre website, uh, what's on page. So uh, I would like to encourage you all to visit the Shine Showcase at the Goldsmiths Centre online shop to support the makers by buying or commissioning their work. These are the new stars of the future. So don't miss out. So thank you and enjoy. Thank you very much, Richard, for such a um, such a wonderful ending to our evening together. I have to say, although I've been working with all of these wonderful makers for um, the last few months with all of my colleagues, and it really has been a huge um, team effort um, across the Goldsmiths um, Centre. Um, I've learned an awful lot more from you all this evening and continue to be really inspired by um, the way you work and the passion for what you do. Um, and as Richard said, particularly within the, the circumstances which we've been operating. I think this time last year, um, we had um, over 100 of you in the centre looking at things face to face, and we could barely have imagined um, that we would be doing this online. But out of this situation, um, 
I think you've all learned brilliant skills. The fact that you've all been able to make your own films and learn how to sell online and do all of these new things, which, um, yes, as I say, would this time of year, um, last year, would have been completely unimaginable. So, um, yes, without further ado, I just want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Thank all of our makers. And um, as Richard said, please do go to the shop have a look, you can watch their films again. And Isabel is just going to show you, <laughs> just in case in, you're in any day, doubt as to um, how to access that information, you go to goldsmithshoptalent.org or you can um, go to the Goldsmith Centre website and in the menu, click shop and it will take you straight through to there. And um, you'll be able to see uh, more information about all of our makers and their wonderful work. So thank you all, um, enjoy the rest of your evening and we hope to see you at, as Rich mentioned, the couple more Meet the Maker events, but also any of um, the Gosman Centre's upcoming programme, which you can of course find on our website. Thank you everybody and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Good night. Bye. <laughs>